Well, hello again. I'm Tom Cockwood. I'm a dentist in Shreveport, Louisiana. Just starting our 51st year of dental practice. Uh, the last 20 of which have been mainly focused on helping people breathe. And I've been asked to give this three-part video series to tell the story of what we've learned in the last 20 years, uh, what we've done to treat ourselves, and what we've done to uh, help other people get better rather than just managing their breathing problems. So bear with me while I figure out how to screen share. And we have our first slide. So this is part two of this video series. Uh, there's my name. There's my email address. If anybody wants to contact me, I'm more than happy to uh, talk to anybody because this is a hugely important thing we're all involved in. And we all have so much to learn. Uh, I'm in no way an expert. I've just spent a lot of time looking at this and I've learned from so many other great teachers. Uh, that's part of what we talked about in the first video. And the title of this presentation is 2020 Breathing Nasodiaphragmatically. Stories from the road on the walk to wellness, including mine. Because what we're trying to do is to not just manage people's breathing's problem, people breathing's, I'm going to try that in English, people's breathing problems, but to actually help them get better so that they can become much healthier. And we call this, I can't remember where we got this, maybe from uh, my functional therapy. It's a walk to wellness. And in the last video, uh, we told about the teachers I've had. Uh, and how, because of what they taught me, I was able to make these changes to myself at age 68. Here you see me getting a year and a half older. Here I am getting a year and a half older, and yet I'm getting a hell of a lot better because of the things we've been taught, the things we've applied to ourselves, and having realized that at age 70, that we could reverse to a large degree a lifetime of chronic inflammatory disease just by learning to breathe, breathe through my nose to my diaphragm, do what it took to get there. We've applied this to other patients and you can see the changes that went on in my own mouth as I attempted to do the impossible, which is to grow new bone structure in my craniofacial respiratory complex at an age at which we were told this couldn't be done. And if you look at these pictures, there are cone beam CT scans made before and after my treatment, which we describe in great detail in part one. The green is my skull and associated parts before treatment. The red is where we actually grew bone in all three dimensions. And uh, these, these changes are pretty dramatic. And I was able to go from a lifetime of being sick to having all these improvements. We're not going to go over this. This was in, in part one, and now we're doing part two. So what we're going to talk about today is none of this is new. It all seems new to us, but it's been around a long, long time. Buddha himself in 1500 BC said, to maintain wellness, close your mouth and breathe through your nose. And of course, that's part of all, kind, all meditation, uh, yoga, mindfulness, uh, exercises. It all focuses on breathing and nasal breathing. This wonderful book is out now by James Nestor. Uh, I, everyone should read this book. I'm really enjoying getting to know him by email. Um, he had, oddly enough, the same story that I've had when he wanted to find out more about breathing. <clears throat> if the physicians 
that he talked to and said, well, breathing's just breathing. It doesn't matter if you breathe through your nose or whether you breathe through a CPAP, it's all the same thing. Well, we know it's not, not all the same thing. And so he went on the same journey that so many of us have gone on. He learned from the same experts uh, in the field who are now my friends and colleagues who have helped me so much. And he ended up in the office of Ted Belfour and corrected a lot of his own problems by wearing homeoblocks just like I did. So what we are gonna talk at great length, we have already about how important it is to look at faces. And then we realize that everyone with a breathing problem has facial asymmetry. It's really hard to find a good picture of James. Here he is with Patrick McEwen. So I went on the internet and tried to find some uh, pictures of him so we could do an analysis of his facial structure. And if you look at this analysis, he's obviously got an asymmetric face and it really looks like his left side is underdeveloped. And then when I took this picture, we get the same result. But this is why if you're gonna use this camera application in your practice, that photograph needs to be straight on and it needs to show both ears. He's actually got, in all these pictures, his head is turned to the left. So I finally pulled this picture off of the great interview he did with Patrick McEwen. That's the only straight on photograph I could find. And we ended up with this, which I call his shroud of Turin camera images. But if you look at it, then we can see really that his right side was underdeveloped. And when he had the homeoblock treatment by Dr. Belfort, you can see on the left side the improvement in his facial symmetry. And if you look at the measured pre and post cone beam CT scans, you can see significant bone growth on the right side of his face and his craniofacial respiratory complex. And these are very similar to my results. That's before and after my treatment. And here you can see the same measurements where I had measurable improvement on my left side. So we all have asymmetric faces, especially those who have breathing problems. And we have spent a lot of time, we'll spend a lot more time talking about faces. We need to look at the faces of, of our friends, our family, and especially our patients. It's my contention that by the time a new airway patient walks past your office, you watch them walk down the hall, you look at their posture, you go into the room, you say hello to them, you look at their eyes because their eyes are gonna tell you immediately whether they're sick or not. And then you look at their faces and their head position. And once you know what to look for, then you will pretty much know what questions to ask. These connections are so important, which is why we spend so much time talking about faces. So today's take home thought, which you've heard in part one and you'll hear a lot more. Everything we're doing is about the tongue and the nose. The tongue and the nose. Because until recently, when I was doing sleep medicine at the medical school, <clears throat> uh, making tap appliances for uh, CPAP non-compliant people with obstructive sleep apnea, we were just trying to get them to breathe at night. Nobody talked about how we wanted them to breathe. Do we want them to breathe through their mouth? Do we want them to breathe through their nose? Is there a difference? Can it make a difference not only in how we manage them, but as to whether or not they get better? We weren't really thinking about behavior. We weren't really thinking about how we breathe. And what we now know for absolutely sure is that it's what we breathe through and how we breathe that counts. Many people can be taught to breathe through their nose and not move a lot of air and they can use the airway they, they have. Of course, we do whatever we can to improve the airway and improve the tone of the airway by working with structure and function problems. And then the big key though is behavior is that we have to change our breathing behavior if we want to actually not only sleep better, but look better, feel better, and take that walk to wellness. And the key to success at any age 
is recruiting and training the tongue to help develop and maintain an adequate linguatorium in which to conduct the business of staying alive and well. Linguatorium, that's my term, we'll talk about it. All right, we'll just move those little boxes out of the way so we can see the screen. Now, I don't ever feel profound, but I tried to think of something really profound to say, and, and <clears throat> this is as close as I can get, because it's all about the tongue, it's all about growth and development, and really our goal today, we have lots of broken adolescents, uh, young adults and old adults who definitely need to be helped, but our goal in treating this huge public health issue is and the ADA is on board with this, thanks to Steve Karstensen and all the work his group has done, is to focus on children's airway health, to check these kids when they're little, figure out if they got a breathing problem, identify it and fix it before they're seven years old, because that is the window in which 85% of growth of the craniofacial respiratory complex takes place. One of the big problems with uh, conventional orthodontic orthodoxies is to wait till age 13 to try to rearrange the furniture in a room that never developed correctly to start with. Earlier is better, and this is not a new idea as we will see. So, the infant's tongue, if it's left to its own natural devices, it will promote the proper growth, function, and behavior of the craniofacial respiratory complex. And then it will conduct for a healthful lifetime the nutritive, communicative, and air conditioning needs of the entire human organism, the business of life. So what happens to that kid's tongue actually before this point may set the traje trajectory for that child's entire life. We know that breathing trumps all other body functions. The development of the structures, functions, and behavior of our breathing apparatus sets the stage for a lifetime of wellness. And the tongue is the key. It also can set the stage for a lifetime of chronic inflammatory disease if the tongue does not do the job it should beginning at or before birth. Here's a slide from, modern, from uh, Scott Simonetti. He says that modern man, and modern man has been studied by Weston Price. We've talked about him before. We'll talk about him later. He's seen the changes that have happened because of cultural changes in diet. We've gone from breastfeeding to these things, which were a poor substitute for a mother's breast. And then when we get to the food, that kids are actually eating today, so much of it requires no chewing, uh, has all of the wrong characteristics when we want good food, is basically non-nutritive. And so these modern changes we've made have created epigenetic tags that restrict our craniofacial bone growth due to inadequate environmental stimulus. And the ones we'll talk about today the most are breastfeeding and eating solid food. Because for 186,000 years, children breastfed for up to three years, and then whatever the parents were eating, they had to eat. And so they started out eating solid food. Because they breastfed, their tongue developed most of the structures and functions of the craniofacial respiratory complex when they were young, but that growth is completed by the need to chew hard food on one side at a time. And this was Mother Nature's prescription, and it was around for a long time until we changed it. And we will talk about those changes and the disastrous effect it has really had on our species because we are currently, through cultural changes, and other uh, epigenetic influences, breeding ourselves to extinction. So I want to give a dentist's perspective on a lifetime of dysfunctional breathing, including mine. Because I couldn't breathe worth a damn until I was almost 70 years old. It still takes constant work, and it's made all the difference. 
and it can for you and your children and your families and your friends and your patients. So let's talk about this. Why are we getting sick, fat, and stupid? And what can we do about it now? We know that bad breathing is the number one public health issue in all developed countries, including ours. And the medical treatment generally addresses only the symptoms, not the cause. The average doctor appointment in the United States today is seven minutes if you're lucky enough to see the physician himself. There's barely enough time to identify the symptom that's created this seven minute visit and to write a prescription to, to treat that symptom. There isn't any time in our current system for the physician to say, well, well damn, you've got all these other symptoms too. Could they, have, could they have a common cause? Could it have something to do with how you're breathing? Should we think about how we could identify that and actually make you well? No, that's not what we have for healthcare in this country today. What we have is disease management. If you think about dental sleep medicine, managing sleep disordered breathing, it is a management, not a cure. It's an airway management strategy, just like a CPAP. It'll keep you from dying at night, but it can create other problems and you may not actually get better. So what we have is sick care, not health care. And the focus of what all of us are doing, all 100 speakers on this, this virtual Congress, all of you who are watching this, all of you who are learning these things so you can help yourself and help others, is we're trying to change healthcare America in this country. So how big is this problem? How sick are Americans from the cradle to the grave? Is it really worth all this brouhaha? I think so. And I think dentistry is leading the charge to identify this and change healthcare into an actual healthcare system based on preventive through promoting wellness through functional nasodiaphragmatic breathing. As the result of disordered breathing, there are 22 Ameri million Americans with obstructed sleep apnea at least. And for every patient you see with obstructed sleep apnea, you're gonna see four or five younger, healthy looking slender patients who have upper airway resistance syndrome. You'll see four or five of those for everybody who's got apnea. They're just people on their way to apnea, which is a continuum. There's an epidemic of obesity. There's an epidemic of diabetes, especially in young children. Half of today's preschoolers are being diagnosed with HD. 40% of them are put on speed to try to manage it when it only makes their insomnia problems worse and their misbehavior is not due to a psychological problem. The psychological issue is the fact that they're sleepy and they can't behave. So if you put them on speed, they can behave at school and everybody says, oh, what a great success. But now they can't sleep and they just get sicker and sicker because again, it's managing the symptom instead of treating the cause. And beyond just ADHD, autism is skyrocketing. And interestingly, if you take a kid with autism and you put them in a high volume oxygen chamber, his behavior gets better. So I don't think there's any question that autism is related to lack of craniofacial development and proper breathing function and behavior. The IQ of American children is declining. We're getting stupider. There's much more atrial fibrillation, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all related to disordered breathing. We're not living as long as we used to for the first time in the history of the United States. A child born today will not live as long as his parents. There are a million point two car accidents every year that involve sleepy drivers. This is a huge demographic problem. And let's look at obesity and its related comorbidities. If you remember the cautionary tale, Wally, about those of us who've gotten so fat and sick and stupid we can't even walk, and we're now we're living in outer space and we just are conveyed around in these, in these devices while we suck on our big gulps and watch television. There's Wally watching them. This is us. This is us right now. 
And the most fascinating statistic is that the most obese subset of people in the United States are healthcare workers. So we've got a broken healthcare system that's run by people who are all sick because they can't breathe easy. They can't breathe either. Uh, to me, I don't know what irony is, but that's got to be irony. This is what's happened to us. Up until about 600 years ago, this was uh, our progress that we made. And then after 600 years, you can see we start going in the other direction. This is a result of cultural evolution. We have changed Mother Nature's prescription for growth and development, and this is what's happened. We didn't do this to ourselves on purpose. We did it for our own convenience and for the good life. But unfortunately, the good life is not treating us so well. And unless something is done to change this, we may end up just like the pig. But at least the pig is now returned. You know, we made our first mistake when we stood up and took a look around and put a 90 degree kink in our voice box. And, and in the area where we breathe. Well, at least that pig has a nice straight airway. So we are breeding ourselves to extinction. <clears throat> Again, how big is the problem? The acute symptoms of dysfunctional breathing are responsible for 60% of all emergency ambulance calls in major U.S. city hospitals. 60%. If you look at this child and you look at this child's face, this is a newborn, all kinds of alarm bells should be going off. You look at that notch in that upper lip, look at that recessive lower lip, look at the child got his head up a little bit trying to breathe, breathe it through his mouth, and he's got venous pooling in circles under his eyes. This is a sick child. And without our help, this child won't live as long as its parents. And this is which, when we should be able to identify this, again, by looking at faces. This is the niece of our hygienist, and she had a stroke at age eight, a stroke at age eight. And if you look at her casts, you can see that she obviously had breathing problems. She obviously had crowded teeth, and it looks like somebody took out four bicuspids to create a orthodontic improvement, then the orthodontics never happened. So she's got this tongue, you can see here, that's just trapped in this tiny little linguatory when she can't breathe. Look how high her palate is. This is a very sick child. So those two children we just looked at, they are literally drowning. Now we can use airway management strategies that keep them from drowning one night at a time. We can do that for everybody with a breathing problem. But what if we can help teach them to swim so they don't drown anymore? We as dentists in our group, the, our interdisciplinary team of allied healthcare professionals, and it takes a team, we can now help these children and adults achieve wellness in a way their physicians either can't or won't. And we're doing it. Let's look at Richard. We'll show him later. He's 40 years old. He's been a patient of mine since he was 16. He had to get 40 years old before I realized from all his dental problems and by looking at his eyes, he was sick and tired. And he was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And it's all related to his breathing. He's sick, tired, sleepy, and drowning. We'll show some pretty dramatic results. Uh, later on in video three, we're gonna show many patients we've treated. We're still just trying to build up the information we need so that when we show how we treat the patients, the how, what, why, and when will all make sense. So six months into his wearing a simple appliance and taping his mouth shut, you can see him having what looks like a great awakening. All right, look at his eyes. Here he is awake. This is after six months wearing, wearing the pod, breathing through his nose. Now let's go back, let's see. This is what he looked like when he walked in for a routine dental visit, sick. So in part three, we'll show his story and those of many others our team has been successful in helping walk to wellness. Here are four of those patients we'll show in the third video. There's Dr. Eric, and we're just gonna look at faces. 
because what is the gold standard for an outcome? The outcome is how do you look? How do you feel? How are you sleeping? All the other metrics are there, but these are the important ones. And a big, big important part is document this by making pictures of their faces and eyes before you treat them and take the pictures later. And sometimes you will just be uh, astonished and sometimes spiritually moved by the changes these people have been able to have with your help and the help of your team. So here he is after 18 months of treatment. Here's Kathy, sweet Kathy. Took a long time to treat her because she was autistic and very easily distracted. So we had to go a little at a time. And, but after just four months of getting her to breathe through her nose, look at the difference in the serenity in her face. Here's Lynn. After six months of simple treatment, she looks like a different person who's come alive. And the last patient we'll show our true miracle patient is my friend Milton, who was dying in that first picture, is no longer dying. Well, we're all dying, but he didn't gonna die as soon as he was going to after eight months of treatment. So this is what we'll show in the last video. These are incredible stories. Uh, I get emotional even talking about it. But what we have to do now is to talk about other things we need to know. If so first, we've got to discuss how have we become so sick, tired, fat, and stupid? When did this start happening to us, this de-evolution of our species? What are the cultural changes that have produced this pandemic of bad breathing? What should we look for diagnostically when we're helping others? And what can we, working as a team, do to help help these people walk to wellness? Well, let's talk about all of that. Part two, which we're doing now, will attempt to answer these questions after we've and so after we've covered the how, what, when, and why. Part three will show the documented case studies, these somewhat astonishing stories of those people who benefited from what we've learned and have figured out how to help them be their best possible selves. So first, let's address these questions. <clears throat> how have we become so sick, tired, fat, and stupid? When did this start happening to us, this de-evolution of our species? What are the cultural changes that have produced this pandemic of bad breathing? Well, this is Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. And if we're looking for scientific, spiritual understanding of what's wrong today, you might say he's the last person we'd look for. But the reason they caught him was he published his man, they, they published his manifesto. And his brother-in-law, his brother realized, gee, that's my brother's writing. And what was the first sentence of his manifesto? manifesto? The Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. And here you can see Ted, these aren't good pictures, but he, when he went to the woods, he learned to stand up straight and breathe through his nose somehow. So he, he obviously had some improvements of his own. But this was his statement, it's exactly what Kevin Boyd has taught us that in about 600 years ago in the Industrial Revolution, women went into the factories, they had to quit raising their children at home, they quit breastfeeding, they put them on gruel, and they gave them to indifferent wet nurses, and that's when the collapse of the craniofacial respiratory complex started, uh, subsequently aided by the fact that we quit eating real food. So we are accidentally, through changes in our modern diets and cultural practices, doing the same thing to ourselves as a species that we did intentionally to the wolf because we took this wonderful animal with this wonderful airway. And if you look at the baby, the baby's gonna be the same because no epigenetic forces have changed that species since that dog showed up to eat with us at the first fire. Our best friend for centuries, and they have changed their original best friend. But somehow breeders thought it would be fun to breed the face off dogs. 
So they just look cuter or be different. And this is the unintend, unintended consequences of cultural evolution. It's the same thing that's happening to us. Because what's happened? We've got bulldogs who suffer and die from uh, obstructive sleep apnea. It's kind of a big deal with the animal rights people. Because if you buy a bulldog, you don't want to have to put him on a CPAP every night. And if we're creating a human, we don't want to have them end up on a CPAP every night either. So what's happened to us? How did it happen? For how long in our history have these problems and their solutions been the subject of current knowledge? Let's look back a century or two. Problems with mouth breathing. Is that a new concept? Well, we've always looked at the village idiot as a mouth breather. So that's part of our modern culture. But let's go back, let's go back to 1831 when George Catlin wrote this book called Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life. Catlin was an interesting character who was a lawyer and a painter and a traveler and an observer. And he spent a lot of time among uh, endemic uh, American Indian populations, if you can say that. If I use the wrong term, so I'm sorry if I offended anybody, but he noticed these people were incredibly healthful, uh, whereas the people back where he lived in the United States weren't healthful. These kids, uh, these uh, Indian kids weren't sick, they didn't have any childhood diseases, and uh, they all had symmetrical faces. And of course, the reason is that they were still living the primitive lifestyle that went back to the very beginning. No epigenetic changes. They also noticed that the mothers would close the mouth of these children after they fed, breastfed, and keep them on their back. So George Catlin, he was not a medical professor, a professional, he was a lawyer. But he was a great noticer and a great thinker, and he was a uh, century before Dr. Weston Price. <clears throat> so here are some illustrations from his book. Uh, here he's showing uh, a patient breathing through his nose while he's sleeping, and he's got a little smile on his face because all's right in the world, and he's getting restored to sleep. But here's somebody who's a mouth breather, breathing on his back, getting a bad night's sleep. So he made the connection between breathing through your mouth to quality of sleep way back then. Because if you breathe through your mouth, you're gonna have poor sleep. But what about daytime breathing? Well, this is what he really noticed. You notice this poor guy who's, who's breathing through his mouth is ugly and sick looking and he's bioretronathic. Doesn't have any development of his face below his eyes. And he also noticed that uh, this same guy, if you look at him from, from the front, he's got poor posture and he's got an asymmetrical face and he looks like he's in terrible distress. Now remember this is uh, 1870 something. And he said, no man or woman with a handsome set of teeth keeps the mouth habitually open. Every person with an unnatural derangement of the teeth is as sure seldom to have it shut. This is not because the derangement of the teeth has made the habit, but because the habit has caused the derangement of the teeth. Pretty profound stuff. Questions we're all trying to unravel today. Principles we're trying to apply in helping everybody we see who seeks our help. <clears throat> and this is fascinating. While I was putting together my slides for, the, for this video, my sweet wife was cleaning house, going through cabinets, getting rid of books, getting rid of knickknacks. It looks like a uh, garage sale going on in our house. So she found this old book that was given to me for my birthday 14 years ago by my good friend, Joe Beard. And it was called Tooth Troubles. And I read it. Actually, I just read one chapter and it absolutely blew my mind. And we're gonna have to talk about this because it's, in this thing from 1925, this enlightened dentist tells us 
virtually everything we need to know today. And apparently it was understood by dentists back then and it has somehow disappeared. But if you're watching this video, we're all part of bringing this back and putting it into practice. In hindsight, I wish, wish I'd read this when he gave it to me, but I thought he gave it to me as a joke because it would have given me a much earlier start on this journey we're in today. So <clears throat> here's a little note, happy birthday. I'm giving you this book in an effort to bring you up to date on modern dentistry and to let you in on many causes and cures of tooth troubles. Well, he wasn't joking. This, is, this was exactly right. That's my good friend, Joe. There we are about 15 years ago. And for me, about 55 pounds ago, we are playing golf at the Broadmoor uh, at the IAG meeting. And believe it or not, the next day we were playing golf in the snow. So this is the book, Tooth Troubles, Their Prevention, Cause and Cure, by Dr. Bernard McFadden. And I was entranced by this, this chapter title, Crooked Teeth Cramp Brain Development. What? what, what, what's he talking about? Well, what he's talking about is the, developmental, the development of the craniofacial respiratory complex, how it's supposed to develop, and exactly what happens if it doesn't. And this book is a guideline for what we need to know today. And it was a hundred years ago. These are just pictures I took from this short chapter and you can see all the things I underlined. Uh, and let's try to synopsize it a little bit. What did he say a century ago about what every dentist should know today, everything that the dentist should know that is so important now? First, lack of development of the jaws leads to improper growth of the craniofacial respiratory complex. This leads to ADHD problems in school, lack of mental development, hearing problems, crooked teeth, mouth breathing with poor breathing function and behavior, nasal, sinus, and tonsil, and adenoid enlargement and infection, poor swallowing and chewing, lack of muscle tone, improper digestion, impaired immune systems, chronic systemic inflammatory disease, bad posture and an ugly face. And he said, talking about his dental colleagues, everyone now admits that the tongue and lips must work correctly to develop the structures and functions of the craniofacial respiratory complex. That's Kevin Boyd's term. He didn't have it back then, but these are the structures and systems he was talking about. He said these growth and development issues should be identified and corrected orthodontically before age seven. And then earlier is always better. These untreated children have been unable to sleep, eat, play, or study as normal children. They may be depressed. They may throw tantrums. They may be easily fatigued. And he noticed they're treating these kids that backward children do better in school after they're corrected. And their mental growth is due to a remarkable stimulus to their brain cells. Well, hell yeah, they're getting oxygen to their brain cells. The teeth and tongue are very intimately associated with proper breathing and voice production. That's, again, it's all about the tongue and the nose. He knew it. He said, after you correct these kids, their faces get symmetrical, they get good looking. And after correction, all the swellings and infections and polyps that they had in their uh, uh, lymphoid tissues clear up, along with remarkable resolution of behavioral problems in stupor because they have that great awakening. They're not sleepy all the time. They're alert and they're healthy because they're breathing through their nose. <clears throat> they achieve better structure, function, and behavior for chewing, swallowing, and breathing because all three of them are connected. People who can't breathe probably don't know how to chew correctly, and they sure as hell don't know how to swallow correctly. And all of this is intrinsic in taking in all of this 
everything we need to sustain life and how we process it. And the tongue and the nose are the key. He said they look better, they function better. Makes sense. That's why it's always bothered me since 1970 when I look at the profile of kids who've had four by cuspids taken out. They all look like Punch and Judy. They're all ugly. They may have straight upper anterior teeth, but the form of their face is wrong. And sure enough, if you look at them, boy, they ain't functioning either. It's time for orthodontics to wake up and smell the coffee. He said these children are now restored to health and they look and behave better. That's the gold standard for an outcome. And he said that all dentists should know these things in 1925. But the physicians in 1925 didn't have a clue. Does that sound familiar? Truly mind blowing. I wish you could get a copy of this book, but I'm sure it's out of print. And it's, I think it was an act of God that it showed up when my wife found it. Gives us hope. So what are the simplified biochemical functional issues with mouth breathing? Well, it's problems processing two substances. Number one is lack of nasally inhaled nitric oxide. Number two is improper exchange and processing of carbon dioxide. All right, let's talk about gas exchange. Well, what about it? Most of us, if we think about gas exchange, it's because we're, our gas grill doesn't work and we've got to go get another tank of propane and exchange the old one for the new one. That's not the kind of gas exchange we're going to talk about. And here are the basics. If you breathe in through your nose, it mixes nitric oxide with the inhaled oxygen. If you breathe through your mouth, you don't get that. Hugely important today, especially in this time of COVID where nitric oxide has been touted as a preventative and a cure for COVID. If you breathe out through your nose, you protect your blood pH and you maintain the oxygen release to your tissues by maintaining the partial pressure of CO2. If you breathe out through your mouth, you probably don't get this protection. So nitric oxide, what's the number one function of nitric oxide? Well, it's a bug killer. Nitric oxide is secreted in the paranasal sinuses at 200 times the concentration necessary to kill any microorganisms trying to invade the body through the nose. This is what Emmett Schneiderman brilliant scientist told me, helped me understand, boy, how potent is this stuff? Why don't we got to use it? And this is where use it or lose it comes in, because if we don't breathe through our nose, we lose all of those functions, including disuse atrophy of the structures and function. Uh, we tend to lose our sense of smell and taste. So this is my good friend, Dave McCarty. He was my doctor and he gave up general practice to go into sleep medicine at LSU Medical School in Shreveport where he ended up heading the department and he took me with him. And for 10 years, I was part of that department. Went to Grand Rounds every Wednesday morning uh, at seven o'clock and every year lectured to the, to the residents about what we were doing. And actually this presentation started when I was asked to give a presentation to the, not only the, the sleep residents, but the neurology physicians, residents, and the pediatric residents. And that's what started this particular cascade in which I've accumulated over a thousand slides in 10 years and I'm trying to concentrate for your edification today. So Dave was one of the first ones to realize the importance of vitamin D, published this article uh, a long time ago. And virtually everybody who has sleep apnea is deficient in vitamin D. And if they're kicking their legs around at night, they're probably deficient in ferritin also. 
But nitric oxide and vitamin D work together in the endothelium to maintain blood pressure too. So nitric oxide is extremely powerful in keeping us alive and keeping us healthy. Uh, its second big function is vasodilation and oxygen transport. If you breathe through your nose, you get nitric oxide mixed with that air, in addition to all the good things your nose does in warming, moisturizing, and filtering the air, getting it to body temperature. It dramatically improves getting oxygen to the red blood cells, and it dramatically improves the release of oxygen to the brain and body. Uh, as Roger Price says, there's so much oxygen out there in the atmosphere, we can get enough of it, no matter how we breathe, we can get enough of it into our bodies. But getting it to actually bond with the hemoglobin and circulate and release is a different story. And a lot of that has to do with carbon dioxide. So mouth breathing is a no-no. I didn't realize that until I made this slide because you get no N-O when you breathe through your mouth. So what's up with mouth breathing and carbon dioxide? Well, it's about end tidal carbon dioxide. There's an example of it shows the curve of the carbon dioxide concentration during one breathing cycle. Uh, this is part of that same illustration uh, that says what end tidal CO2 is. And that's in tidal CO2. Is that when you are through exhaling, before you take your next inhale, it's the partial pressure of carbon dioxide that stays in your in your body and blood at the end of exhalation. Ideally about 47 millimeters of mercury. Could it be more critical at SpO2? Uh, in all my years of uh, sleep medicine, everybody just talks about oxygen. Yeah, we, God, yeah, we got to have oxygen. But how we get oxygen, how we use it, depends a lot on CO2 balance. The CO2 balance is, depends largely on whether we breathe, how we breathe, and whether we breathe through our mouth or our nose. The sleep medicine focuses primarily on blood oxygen saturation, SpO2. It's, it's entitled. Uh, partial pressure of CO2 may be more important. Well, it's just a waste product, right? No. If we over or under breathe carbon dioxide through our mouth, it'll make you sick and it'll keep you sick. And when mouth breathers exhale orally, they frequently over breathe and blow off too much carbon dioxide, which lowers the PCO2. This keeps blood oxygen from being delivered to the tissues. It creates what's called the Bohr effect or the oxygen dissociation curve, where the oxygen takes a ride around the body and systems attached to, to the erythrocytes, but it doesn't get released where it needs to be. And during sleep, this causes loop gain. The sleep, the sleep drive is, is suppressed because the blood is pH is being threatened. That creates central sleep apnea, and that's what I had. And it's mouth breathing causes central sleep apnea. Because if you lower the PCO2, you change the pH of the blood. And even though it's a waste product, it's got to be maintained at about 47 millimeters of mercury. If it falls, it reduces and it res results in respiratory acidosis, which eventually will lead to metabolic alkalosis. This is all the theories of Roger Price. And then the brain and the body are going to immediately respond to the loss of PCO2 by constricting tubes in the bodily systems. And there are a lot of bodily systems that have tubes in them. And if you constrict those tubes, you're going to compromise function. And so the first most obvious result of mouth breathing and lowering the PCO2 is your nose gets stopped up. You know, I always thought I had to breathe through my nose, breathe through my mouth because my nose was stopped up and I was addicted to afrin and sprays for years. Well, no, I, my nose was stopped up because I was breathing through, through my mouth. And many of you will find if you're congested, 
If you just sit down and tape your mouth shut for about five minutes, your nose will probably clear up. That's your body saying, hey, this is, yeah, this works. Maybe we should do this all the time. So if you get nasal congestion, that leads to more mouth breathing. And along with the lack of inspired nitric oxide to many functional somatic syndromes, central sensitization syndromes. These are non-communicable chronic inflammatory disease processes that are all affected by whether or not we breathe through our mouth or our nose. And so if you breathe through your mouth, your nose get, may get clogged up. If you breathe through your mouth, you may end up with an x-ray of your ileocecal junction like mine in the 1980s, where you can see my bowel is constricted. And that was the diagnosis of my Crohn's disease, which I really believe, along with my inability to chew and swallow correctly, was due to my lifetime of mouth breathing. If we want balance, those of us who don't breathe correctly are not in homeostasis. Our sympathetic nervous system is running the show when it shouldn't be, and so we're in a condition of allostasis, which is our body's attempt to maintain some type of balance. But if we want homeostasis and complete balance, we've got to breathe through our nose to our diaphragm and back. So homeostasis does this, and so does restorative sleep, and so does the maintenance of total bodily wellness and not just during sleep. So let's look at <clears throat> some of the horrors of mouth breathing. This is Dr. Eagle Harvalls. He was an orthodontist who was really interested in mouth breathing. And so he did this very cruel multi-year study on previously healthy rhesus monkeys who started out looking like this and ended up looking like this. And they had all of these negative changes in their structure, function, and behavior because he forced them to breathe through their mouth. And we've got to remember if mouth breathing could make these changes in one generation in a monkey, and we got 90% of the DNA, how does that apply to us? Well, it does apply to us. This is just a, a primate study to suggest the truth of all that. So what was his experiment? The nostrils of healthy monkeys were obturated with silicone plugs for years, forcing the monkeys to breathe orally. Some of them just died, couldn't learn to breathe through their mouth. The ones who lived, their, their lips became notched as they switched to mouth breathing. Their tongues dropped down as new muscles were recruited to help swallow and breathe creating hypertonicity and activity in these muscles that should have been relaxed all the time. They all developed an open mouth posture. And because of that hypertonicity and their inability to breathe correctly through their mouth, they started shoving their mandible forward rhythmically, trying to breathe. They developed anterior open bites, poor posterior occlusions, and dual bite positions. When he took out the plugs and restored nasal breathing after three years, their lips and tongues returned to the normal appearance, configuration, and function, but the malocclusions remained. He repeated this experiment by taking Purina monkey chow, which was crunchy and required chewing unilaterally, and he microwaved it to turn it into mush so that eating it reduced the need it the need for extended mastication. And this also produced similarly disastrous epigenetic changes in their phenotypes. So this applies to what we're talking about today and not only that we gotta breathe through our nose, but again, back to 186,000 years ago, kids breastfed for three to five years and then immediately transitioned to hard food. Both of those things are critical to growth and development. So Harvald, in pursuit of understanding the dangers of mouth breathing, intentionally did these barbaric things to these monkeys. Dog breeders have done this intentionally to our best friend. 
And right now we're doing it to ourselves. Look at some of Sandra Khan's pictures. Look at these sick kids who are mouth breathers. And if you look back far enough in their history, you will find ancestors who didn't have these problems. These are epigenetic changes created by our cultural changes. And because of the tagging of our DNA, we may have had parents who had public, who had perfect craniofacial respiratory structures. And because of the change that we were raised, we developed these characteristics and then we pass them on to the next generation. And that's what's happening to us now. So how early in a child's life can these negative outcomes start? Well, Kevin Boyd would say they begin with the breathing status of the mother-to-be before she gets pregnant. And there is evidence to support this. Any woman who thinks she ought to get pregnant, wants to get pregnant, should have her breathing evaluated. And if she has dysfunctional breathing, she's gonna have the best shot of a successful outcome with her upcoming pregnancy if her own breathing problems can be corrected first. But instead of starting prenatally, let's talk Let's start immediately with a newborn after an ideally non-induced vaginal delivery because now we induce these deliveries so that the doc can make his tea time. We don't do vaginal deliveries because it's easier on the mama to unzip them into a C-section. And there should be a, nor a normal prolonged labor process with multiple contractions followed by periods of rest during which thousands of genetic switches are turned on in this fetus before he or she emerges. This is mother nature's prescription, another of which we've largely abandoned. But this is when it can start because many of the wrong choices are being made today. The abandonment of breastfeeding is, is one of them. And I can certainly understand the problems with them. Both parents are working, how's the mother gonna pull that off? Just all kinds of inconvenience. But if you wanna raise a healthy child, they need to be breastfed. I have been criticized by a female myofunctional therapist for talking about breastfeeding since I'm just a man but this is not sexist. This is anthropological. This is an interest in the betterment of humanity. And the problem is today, the inmates seem to be running the asylum. Most recently, we are reaping the bitter harvest of the 1960s. When mothers quit breastfeeding for convenience and to be modern. ENT physicians quit taking out tonsils and adenoids by and large. Orthodontists began condemning and amputating perfectly good permanent premolars to retract arches to provide straight teeth. I mean, look, at, look in the phone book under dentists and orthodontists. See if you see anything about health, growth, and development. It's all about smile. It's all about how do the social six look in front when the person smiles. It's my contention that of all of the important things relative to our oral condition, the appearance of our smile is the least important. And if you'll forgive my language, uh, I said at the table clinic at the Restorative Academy that the smile is just the icing on the dental cake. And if the cake is made out of shit, what good is it? So in the 60s, fast feared, oh God, here's McDonald's. Goodbye to home cooked family meal time. So the kids can't sit down with the parents who can't look, learn proper table manners. And if you look at Sandra Kahn's book, there's some wonderful uh, myofunctional therapy techniques in there that basically happen at the dinner table when the child is eating with the parents, has to sit up straight, breathe through the nose, bring the food up to their mouth, chew it at least 20 times while breathing through their nose, take in no liquids while they're doing that, don't talk while they're eating, swallow gently and wait at least 15 seconds before 
resuming the same thing. This is what our grandmothers taught us, and if kids can learn to do all of that, it will aid greatly in their developing correct funct structure, function, and behavior. But anyway, kids don't even eat with their parents anymore, and they're eating the wrong food. And then television began advertising food directly to the kids, and the kids began to take charge of their diets. And we now consume too much food, most of it the wrong food. On top of that, we've got post-war industrial pollution, which was going to exacerbate any of the allergic issues related to breathing. And obstructive sleep apnea is a result of all these changes. And that's how we as dentists got our foot into the back door of sleep medicine in the 1990s. All of this sickness happened. We got all these fat old men with sleep apnea and they can't wear a CPAP. What are we gonna do? Well, maybe if we put something in their mouth and drag them forward, they'll breathe better at night. So dentistry got into breathing medicine by treating the end stage of obstructive sleep apnea. And once we got our foot in the door, those enlightened among us, such as Kevin Boyd said, whoa, whoa wait a minute, let's look way back to the start. This is an end stage condition in old people. When did it start? And what happened then? And how early should we treat it? But anyway, that's how we got into the door. So dental sleep medicine treated sleep disordered breathing. And to me, the dental sleep medicine is a, a bad term because it's not just about sleep. Sleep disordered breathing is a bad term because it's, <laughs> it's disordered breathing that happens 24 hours a day. It just happens to be worse at night when, when we're asleep because we're the most vulnerable. So anyway, this is about telling stories. And so from the 1990s to about 2010, we had these people who couldn't stand their CPAPs, wanted to throw them in the trash. And so we use these oral appliances to fix the problem with the airway management strategy based on the idea that we would drag the lower jaw forward and somehow that would help them breathe at night and all would be good in the world. These are management strategies. Management strategies. And Roger Price has some great images. Here's his view of the American healthcare system in 2018. The ambulance is at the bottom of the hill. On the left side, that's our healthcare system. If you fall off that hill because you're so sick and you crash at the bottom, the ambulance will take you to the hospital. What we needed was somebody in medicine at the top of the cliff to keep us from falling off that hill. That's, what, that's us up there now. That's what we're trying to do. It's my personal and professional experience that mouth breathing alone, irrespective of airway obstruction, can lead to a lifetime of chronic inflammatory, functional somatic syndromes and diseases. So as far as that, that last line, chronic inflammatory, functional somatic syndromes, uh, you really need to look up the writings of Dr. Avram Gold, a pulmonologist, sleep physician in New York, who's written some wonderful books, uh, wonderful articles that talk about upper airway resistance syndrome, how critical it is. And I think he calls these central sensitization syndromes. He goes into great detail about the relationship between just impaired breathing and a, a lifetime of disease processes. Dr. Avram Gold, you really need to read his stuff. All right, these are our mouth breathers and they're sick. And this is the great book that uh, Sandra Kahn and Paul Ehrlich wrote. Everyone should read this. Every parent should read it. Every wife should read it. Every mother and grandmother should read it. And every dentist should read it. And every physician should read it. And there's some great statements in there. Everything in the face needs its own place in space. Boy, is that true. And we, we've talked about that some, we're gonna talk about that a whole lot. 
because it's basically the tongue that needs its face and its place in space. And they also say that it is our hope that recognizing facial deformity as a preventable condition will lead to a socioeconomic movement to change that environment to prevent the condition. That's exactly the message we're trying to give you here today. And again, it's about the tongue, the nose, and the diaphragm, which is the pump for the lymphatic system. And successful transformation, now I'm talking about transforming patients, not managing them. It's about changing structure, function, and behavior. These are the three big, three biggies. And of all of them, behavior is the most important. If the tongue and the nose don't work in harmony, it shows in your eyes. Ron Perkins, my classmate from Baylor, who is an orthodontist in Dallas, has been growing airways on kids since 1970, much to the chagrin of his peers who were waited to treat until the kids are 13. Uh, and Ron has given me some great information first, if the, the eyes are the window to the soul. Look at the patient's eyes before you do anything and you'll know whether or not they're sick. He also gave me the great advice that of all the metrics you have, if you're treating a patient, uh, make an inventory of symptoms before you start and then follow the symptoms. Again, look at their eyes. Now, speaking of eyes, and this is just interesting, here was an ad for a local eye surgeon. And you can see on the left were patients before he did some type of tightening up of their tissues. And on the right side is the result. And there's no question that the tissue is the issue, but the bone sets the tone. <clears throat> Nothing has been done. We've, we've got to remember that the face is just a mask that hangs on the skull. And it's the shape of the structures of the skull of the CRFC that determine how that face is going to look. And if you look at these patients, yeah, their eyes are more open because those tissues have been stretched open. But if you look in their eyes, they don't really look any better. It's my contention, they're still just as sick. This is another symptomatic management for aesthetic purposes. So looking at that uh, ad, I thought, well, let's. Let's look at three of our patients' eye pictures before and after the treatment we did, and they certainly didn't have any cosmetic surgery. So what if plastic surgery isn't necessary? Well, there's Richard. Well, boy, look, his eyes are open, but he looks different. He's, he's better. Here's Eric. Boy, he's tired. His eyes are drooping. His face is, nose is red. Now these pictures are all made with the same camera and the same lighting. Not only does do his eyes look a lot better, so does the neighborhood. And there's Milton, and look at the change in him. So this to me is kind of fascinating. Uh, the, the aesthetic improvements we get along with actually walking these people to wellness where they go from being sick every day and night to actually being well looking good and feeling well and sleeping well. Sleep's just part of it. <clears throat> Let's talk about the autonomic nervous system. We've got the central nervous system that's letting me do this talking right now, but behind the scenes, the autonomic nervous system should stay in balance. we got the sympathetic branch, which is the fight or flight response to stressors and the, the Sympathetic branch should only really be functioning uh, during the daytime when we have some type of real stress to which our body and brains need to respond. At night, the sympathetic nervous system should be almost completely shut down so that the parasympathetic branch, the rest and recuperation and digestive branch can come in and fix everything. These have to be in balance. And really at night, the only time the sympathetic should be running is during REM cycles when we breathe. And we, we have uh, paralysis uh, 
a tonia during REM sleep to keep us from acting out our dreams because there is sympathetic activity going on then. We don't want sympathetic activity going on all night because the patient's sending off red flags because their brain says they're not going to get enough oxygen. So it needs to be in balance all the time, not only when we sleep, but with every breath, every breath. This promotes high heart rate variability, which is a whole lecture. But the basics are that our, our heart rate can run up to 200 times a minute. And there can be changes between each heartbeat where the heart rate slows up, slows down 50% or speeds up up to four times. And it's that high variability that is the number one indicator of health. So if we have these things in balance every time we breathe, it promotes heart rate variability through autonomic nervous system homeostasis and it promotes health. Close your mouth, this is the key. All breathing, especially during sleep, should take place from the nose to the diaphragm and back. The only times air should be moving in the mouth is when you're speaking, eating, or doing oral hygiene. The rest of the time, you should be breathing through your nose and the tongue and lips should provide a triple seal. The lips are naturally tacky to maintain a lip seal. The tip of the tongue should seal the airway anteriorly against the hard palate and the teeth, then the back of the tongue should provide a posterior seal when it's up against the soft palate. So it's important that we control breathing at night, but it's very important that we practice breathing during the daytime. Again, with the tongue in the roof of our mouth. We want to breathe silently and gently from our nose to our diaphragm and back. The three stages of breathing are first, breathe where other people can't hear you breathing. Then breathe where you can't hear yourself breathing. And then learn to breathe so quietly and gently you don't really know whether you're breathing in or out. That's the behavior we're trying to adapt so that we can use our airways. We want to take 10 or few fewer breath cycles a minute. We want to slow down the rate of breathing promotes parasympathetic activity. We want to inhale for about six seconds, then exhale for about six seconds. This utilizes our entire lung volume because we're filling our lungs by breathing from our diaphragm. If we breathe through our mouth, we're using our intercostal muscles. We're only using the top third of our lungs. We're not using the diaphragm, so it it compromises our immune system. We get sicker and we stay sicker. So after you've exhaled, don't inhale again until you feel the need to, you feel that oxygen hunger. This promotes high heart rate variability and autonomic nervous system homeostasis, which are the number one metrics of good health. There are three, three really important muscles in our bodies. <clears throat> First is the heart. If our heart doesn't beat, nothing happens. Second is our diaphragm. The diaphragm James Nestor refers to as the second heart. Boy, is it important. If we're mouth breathers, we ain't using it. The third is our tongues. The tongue is the rudder of the body and brain. It steers our life from birth to death if it works correctly. And of all of these organs, the tongue is the one that runs the show. Because it develops the airway. And let's talk about development of the airway and how the tongue is involved with that. A sign of the apocalypse is that this book by N. Lo Han is Hans is out of print. It used to be required reading for every orthodontic graduate student, and it's now out of print, which may explain a whole lot about what's going on in modern day orthodontics.
The very first thing they say is that the airway functions as the keystone to facial development. And if you look at a keystone and you look at that arch, if that keystone weren't there, that arch would completely collapse. So if you're building a face, you got to build it around the keystone and the keystone is the maxilla. And that's the proper form of the maxillary arch. It should be a Roman arch. And it should be a negative replica of the tongue, which acts as the scaffold in early childhood to develop the maxilla. So the maxilla needs to be a garage in which the tongue is just parked. And 99% of the time, the tongue in its rest position doesn't have to do anything. It's just when we want to talk or eat and the tongue has to come into action that it leaves the garage and gets to work. So the tongue should develop that arch. So how do the tongue and other soft organs in the head participate in growing the structures of the airway and the CRFC? This is a big question, which must be answered so we can understand why we have these issues today and what we can do to correct them. It explains the science of why we can reinstitute bone growth in adults and in pe people of any age, but including adults. Again, Inlow and Hahn say the airway is the keystone to facial development, and development of the maxilla is the key to development of the airway. So what's the role of the tongue in facilitating nature's genetic blueprint for the development of the structures, function, and behavior of the airway and the craniofacial respiratory complex. Well, the maxilla grows by inframembranous, intramembranous bone growth. Excuse my French. So the tongue is going to grow the maxilla. And the critical part is not only that the maxilla develop in that picture on the left, but in all three dimensions, including in the very young, the premaxilla. And it's a deficient in the deficiency in the premaxilla that is critical uh, to be developed very early in children, and that is the hardest thing to develop in adults. Now, if you look at the picture on the left, it looks like a Halloween jello mold, but this is a mold in which the jello grew the mold, the mold doesn't grow the jello. As these soft organs begin to grow, they create the bony housing for them. So as the brain grows, it grows the cranium because this is intramembranous bone that is created by stimulation of stem cells by pressure from the soft tissue and the stem cells activate sutural growth. Otherwise, the growth, the, what goes on at that suture, those stem, stem cells just sit there and make fat unless they are instructed to make and develop, develop and make and maintain bone. So the brain grows the cranium, the eyes grow most of the orbits. And if you look at this famous uh, British politician is missing an eye, you can see that throughout his life, his orbit has failed to grow like the other because that he no longer has an eyeball in there potentiating that growth. Same kind of collapse here. <clears throat> so the tongue, look down there at the tongue, it grows everything below the eyes and the airway. Hard to believe, but true. And if you look back at what Dr. Bernard McFadden said 100 years ago, everybody understood this in 1925. We need to understand it today and harness it and put it to use. So these structures that we're talking about, that the tongue grows, make up the splanchnocranium. The splanchnocranium is there in blue. So the action of the tongue <coughs> grows all of these intramembranous cranial structures in blue that you see, and some of the base of cranium, including the sphenoid bones, because when we grew my uh, structures, I had significant lateral growth in my sphenoids. 
So the action of the tongue, as we said, activates stem cells to promote sutural apposition of new bone. So that tongue's got to be working immediately after birth if you want that part of the CRFC to develop. The mandible, however, is a long bone which grows by endochondrial genetic prescription if it is permitted by adequate development of the maxillary arch. So the maxilla has really got to develop first, but with the tongue developing it so it can create enough space and volume for the mandible to grow forward following it to fulfill its genetic potential. So uh, let's go here to a little southern colloquialism now. In the grand scheme of cranial facial respiratory development, the tongue is your mama. As we say in the south, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Mama's got to create her own workspace that I call the linguatorium because it doesn't have a name. She's got to create her own kitchen in which to perform her multiple duties. Now, if we look at a symphony conductor, in order for him to succeed in pulling off a good performance, <clears throat> he's got to have an auditorium so that the orchestra can get its act together and deliver it properly. Now the tongue, in order to run the show of life, must have an adequate linguatorium, which it helps to construct and maintain. That is an inadequate linguatorium. There's not enough room for the tongue because the tongue didn't grow it. So what now obvious tongue-related development, structural, functional, and behavior issues might contribute? to this huge public health problem we're looking at right now where everybody's fat, stupid, sick, and tired because they can't breathe. And as we look back at how we've examined patients over the years, what is it we may have just missed and not noticed in the past <clears throat> in our patient exams and routine diagnostic records? All right, let's talk about diagnostic CAS to start with. This is how, in the past, we used to look at diagnostic CAS. And one of the changes we made in 1976, when I decided to become somewhat of a student and began to learn all the mathology and record keeping, we started making diagnostic CAS on every new patient. In dental school, we only made casts if somebody were missing teeth. It was never suggested that we can see more on casts of the mouth than we can by looking in the mouth, and therefore, we should have them for every patient. And so we make them for every patient, and we make them every 10 years, too, so we can uh, see changes on the cast you just can't see by looking in the mouth. Nonetheless, here's some... Uh, just the average diagnostic cast. This is usually how we look at them. We're looking at the upper front teeth, see if they're straight. But this is how we ought to be looking at them. Because if we're saying that the first thing that every dentist should do for every new patient, regardless of their age, is to see if they breathe through their nose, to do an airway examination, then we need to do an airway examination and we need to look at their linguatorium and we need to look in, on the study cast and see what the structural issues look like. And in this case, this is an inadequate linguatorium. There's a narrow, high vaulted palate. If you look at the palate of rugae, they're all rough. Now, if the tongue's living up there, up there, it smooths those out. So we know the tongue doesn't live up there. There's not enough space for the tongue on the lower. And if you look at the anterior tooth arrangement, you can see there's way too much vertical overlap because the maxilla has grown vertically instead of horizontally. So that's how we need to start looking at study cast. And there's a lot we can tell when we're taking the impression about what the patient's problems are. 
If we're having trouble getting an impression because we're fighting muscles, that tells us something about structure, behavior, and function. So let's look at Rand. He's a 59 year old male. He was not our dental patient. He was referred to me by the orthodontist. <clears throat> and he had extraction, retraction, orthodontics when he was an adolescent. He just finished having Invisalign. And during the Invisalign treatment, we managed his snoring with a sequence of MyTaps we would put over. We actually would take a MyTap and readapt it to his Invisalign appliances as they were changed to manage his breathing problems at night without doing anything to fix them. And now he's through with orthodontics. We are trying to see, can we fix it? <clears throat> so he's still snoring and moving a lot during sleep, but he does not have obstructive sleep apnea at this point. If he had a sleep test, his apnea hypopnea index would be less than five. The sleep doc would say, hey, you're fine. All you need is a little sleep hygiene. Well, he's not fine and sleep hygiene is not gonna help him in the long run. So what the hell's going on here? Can we tell something not only, you can look at his teeth there and see it. You can look at his face. There's a lot we can see from the face, but what can we tell from his impressions and his study cast? Just by looking at things we didn't look at before because we didn't know what to look at. And by processing these casts maybe in a different way than we did in the past, because we were all trained to look at the teeth first. There's a set of his casts as we would normally have them. And I can tell a lot on that, not just about the teeth, but mainly we're just looking at the teeth. So that's what a normal set of trim diagnostic casts looks like. <clears throat> but to understand his dental problems and other problems, should we check out the neighborhood in which these teeth are attempting to survive? Can we see that on cast before we trim them? Can we see it in the impression? I mean, there's his teeth. We're just looking, there's his study cast. That's his dentition. It's an old structure in need of maintenance, helped along by you and your team. So before we make decisions, should we just look at the teeth? Or what other information can we get early on? Are his teeth struggling in a deteriorating environment like this? I mean, if you were trying to sell that house, just based on that picture, you might get $50,000 for it. But if you look at the neighborhood, that might be a whole different story. We need to look at the neighborhood. So here are the trimmed casts. Here are a couple. Let's look at his dentition's immediate surroundings. And here are a couple of casts that haven't been trimmed, and I've made some notations on them. A lot of stuff we can see there we didn't see on what we usually get every day. A lot of things going on there. What can we see? Well, on the impression and the cast, I had a hard time. I had to use a very large tray in a very small dental arch because a small tray wouldn't fit over get all these bony exostoses. And I had to use a big tray on the lower for a small arch because his facial muscles are, and tongue are so hyperactive, they wouldn't let me seat the tray. And you can see that on the cast and you can see it in the impression. So in that impression, we can see a big maxillary torus, including one in the roof of his mouth. There's that one. And you can look at it on the cast. So both that untrimmed cast and that impression shows, man, look at all this excess bony overgrowth. What's going on with that? Also the trouble we had making the impressions <clears throat> because of these hypertonic muscles show up on the impression. You can see the impression in the cast. Those facial muscles should be all relaxed. They're not relaxed, they're hypertonic, just like in Harval's monkeys because he can't swallow correctly, because he's a mouth breather. So we know that before we even pour the cast. And then we can see this restricted frenum that he has. He's tongue-tied. So we can see all of that from the cast. We can also see 
these got mandibular tori, which you can see on the impression. You can see where he went through the tray on the impression there. Lots you can see. So here's Kathy. Here's another set of untrimmed casts. Pictures of her eyes that show how tired she is. Show all the things that we've been missing in the past because we didn't think while we were taking the impression. We probably had an auxiliary making the impression. We didn't think before we trimmed the cast. And so we missed the opportunity to see a whole lot that's going on. If our number one goal for our patient is to take a look and see if they can breathe and if they can't to help them do that because they're not going to have good dental health if they can't breathe correctly and they're not going to have good general health if they can't breathe correctly. So these are things we need to see. First we get it from looking at their faces and their postures. Then we get it when we take the impression. Boy, then we get it when we look at the cast. This is before we even start doing oximetry or taking symptoms. So if we look at, at her impressions in the cast, you can see the same hyperactive orofacial muscles. You can see them on the cast and you can see them on the impression. Now one of her big problems is she has a very hard time swallowing. Well, that's because these hyperactive facial muscles are doing her swallowing instead of her tongue. And this, the impression in the cast will tell us one of the reasons she can't swallow. Also, if we look at her <clears throat> big tongue tie, look at her restricted frenum, which you can see on the cast and on the impression, then we know her tongue's not coming up and forward to help her swallow correctly. Her mouth muscles are having to do all the work, so that shows difficulty in swallowing. So this is just a suggestion is let's keep our eyes open early on when we first start gathering information to be alert for things we missed because we just didn't know how to look. And yet here's another case. This is Beth. She got some serious issues and there's a lot, a lot of little things we can see going on with those casts, even on a set of trimmed casts. So we mark the occlusal interferences, and you can see her big tori, big palatal torus, huge lingual tori, and her tongue is submerged and attached way down deep. She needs her tongue released. She needs the bone released. She needs her CRSC developed. She needs myofunctional therapy. And then she needs the dentistry she came to see us for. She didn't like the appearance of her smile and wanted that fixed. That'll be the absolute last thing we do. So, what other genetically driven actions of the jaws, teeth, and muscles promote normal development of these structures? Answer, proper chewing and swallowing of real food. For 186,000 years, children breastfed for years, and then they switched to solid food. The proper early diet way back then involved baby led weaning from breast milk to hard foods and symmetrical development of faces and airways was the norm for almost a quarter million years. All of this change has really happened, happened a little bit with the agrarian revolution uh, where we went from being hunter gatherers to having civilization and growing our own food. But it really, as Kevin will tell you, all came from the Industrial Revolution. So this is how a baby born now should be raised. Immediate breastfeeding, followed by at least a year of breastfeeding, followed by eating solid food. That's mother nature's prescription for growth and development. But unfortunately, this is today's bad diet for infants and toddlers. That bottle is no substitute for mother's breast or for bonding with the mother. Those kids need to be eating an orange or an apple, but they sure don't need to be having just juice. These are the raw fruits and vegetables they should be eating, but instead, Mr. Gerber got the brilliant idea 
And if you whiz them all up into this crap, that's what babies ought to eat. That's never happened in the history of human evolution that, ch that young children should eat pre-chewed food. That's crazy. That's one of the big factors in inhibiting growth and development and the epigenetic tags that have made this almost commonplace today. So none of these things happen in the early years. Then by the time it's time for the kid to eat the real food, they're eating macaroni and cheese and microwave chicken nuggets, the same kind of stuff Harbaugh gave to the monkeys to inhibit their craniofacial growth and to, to promulgate their mouth breathing. So we, we've got some serious problems going on today due to cultural changes. <clears throat> so this has resulted in the 20, 21st century prevalent pediatric phenotype and we now have Harval's children. Long face mouth breathers who are sick, and I was one of them. So is my wonderful granddaughter, Lainey. She almost choked to death on reflux vomitus. She was sleeping in her crib. Ginger went to Memphis to help, uh, help with the baby and was in the room with Lainey. As soon as she got home from the hospital, she was sleeping in her crib, had reflux, choked on it, and would have died if Ginger hadn't been there to save her life. So how's that for a family airway story? And still, she's a preteen now, and she still, still has an aversion to eating solid food. And if you look at her face years ago, you can see why I have been so concerned uh, since she was a young child. Because she's an example of not only did she not breastfeed, which created this vertical growth of her maxilla and all the subsequent cascading effects with structure, function, and behavior, she never has been able to eat solid food. Because chewing soft food requires only vertical jaw movement. Jaw doesn't ever really learn how to move around correctly, and the muscles don't learn how to work correctly, and they don't understand understand and develop the ability to chew on one side at a time and everything gets crowded look at those lower front teeth it requires at least 10 attempts to teach children on a soft diet to transition to hard foods so the best time to make that happen is before they develop this aversion to hard foods because chewing hard foods is essential in deriving the benefits of mechanotransduction Mechanotransduction are the many mechanisms by which cells convert mechanical stimulus into chemical activity. In this case, chewing on one side at a time is a mechanical stimulus that turns on chemical activity in the stem cells to initiate sutural growth of bone. Very important. And not only sutural growth of bone, but stimulus, constant stimulus grows and maintains bones. And if you don't use it, you lose it, which is why old people like me should keep moving. If you keep moving, you keep stimulating your bones and you're less likely to uh, have a broken hip. Mechanotransduction is responsible for a number of senses and physiological processes in the body, including proprioception, touch, balance, hearing, and bone growth. And interestingly enough, in terms of balance, our brains use 25% of our energy just trying to keep us from falling down. So here's, here's mechanotransduction. During mastication of solid foods, solid foods, the teeth, the mandible, and its musculature create and distribute forces of mechanotransduction. And as you chew on a side at a time, if you look at that trapezoid on the face, that's where bone growth is initiated through the simple act of normal chewing. These forces are unilateral, torsional, intermittent forces 
because you're not chewing on both sides. It's unilateral and torsional, and it's not constant like clenching your teeth. So these, these forces are good forces, and they turn on stem cells and activate sutural growth. <clears throat> They're also the, the basis behind the pot appliance, which we'll talk about, and the basis of the homey block appliances that we've talked about. So this type of force is not bilateral, compressive, sustained force. For instance, clenching with your mouth empty on both sides, which can happen so often in people who can't breathe because they're trying to lower their heart rate and cut off sympathetic activity. But these are destructive forces. So mechanotransduction are the pos positive mechanical forces initiated by chewing that institute the growth, development, and maintenance of all the structures we're talking about. <clears throat> so if you look at, at the effect of mechanotransduction, you take a look at a pitcher, and if you take a look at his pitching arm, and then you look at a bone density study on that arm, that's what that bone looks like. But if you look at the other arm, just the normal everyday athlete's arm, look at the difference. Pretty phenomenal. So mechanical stimulation creates bone and maintains bone. This is an example of mechanotransduction at work and at play. These forces stimulate bone development of the airway and the face at any age. And if you look at that shape and you look at my cone beam CTC made before and after my homeoglot treatment, the green is my bone structure before treatment and the red is where we grew new bone by harnessing these same principles and you can see it's in exactly these same areas uh, and including the mandible. So what other developmental, structural, functional, and behavior issues might contribute to this huge public health program? And this story just keeps on coming back to the tongue. Yep, here are a bunch of tongues that are a problem. These are the tongues of little children, and they all have something in common. They're all restricted. Yes, these are restricted. These kids all have ankyloglossia, or a tongue tie, or a tethered tongue. This is not normal development of a neonatal tongue ready to suckle. When and how, let me try that again. When and how does this pandemic deficiency, I mean, we're seeing an epidemic of this now, in adults and children. When and how does, does this start? Well, interestingly, back when my parents were born, around the turn of the century, Everybody had multiple kids because there were no vaccines and there were no antibiotics and infant mortality was a big deal. A lot of kids died. Both of my parents lost siblings. And so for hundreds of years, these babies were delivered by midwives and the midwives knew that if that baby couldn't suckle, that baby couldn't survive. And so they all kept a long fingernail. And when the baby was born and they cut the cord, they just take that long fingernail and just sweep it under the, under the baby's lip, under the, excuse me, sometimes the lip, but mainly the tongue, to free up that tongue so the baby could latch on to mother and thrive. In Brazil, it's now a, a, a national law that this has to be checked on every newborn and it should be checked on every newborn in this country. So yeah, it starts early. It starts in utero. Because in utero, we should have what's called apoptosis. If you look at embryology, we all grow together from little globs of tissue that merge and then separate. And so there's a program cell death before birth in which all the little fibrous attachments that were there 
should completely dissolve to deliver a complete child. And they may not complete before birth now, especially if the mother doesn't breathe well. Especially if the pregnant mother has disordered sleep breathing, and this contributes to what's called syndactyly, or webbed extremities. Virtually all pregnant women have obstructive sleep apnea, especially during the last trimester. And here's one of them, she's Lauren. She's one of our patients. She's pregnant and she has ERS, extraction, retraction, regret syndrome. This is her third, second or third pregnancy. We've been trying to help her breathe since before the first one because she had extraction, retraction, ortho, and she was an adolescent and her tongue thrust was so bad, they put tongue spurs on the lingual of her lower front teeth to beat her tongue back into submission. And it beat her tongue back into blocking her oral nasopharyngeal airway. So she's had trouble breathing ever since. And we've tried managing it up to now, and now we're trying to fix it. Anyway, she's a mouth breather with UARS before this pregnancy. We treated her with a MITAP early on, which uh, cured the snoring, but caused bite changes. So here she is. And if you look at her face, she doesn't look like she's doing too well. Skin tone's not good. Color's not good. She's got a lot of uh, chronic inflammatory stuff going on with her nose and all around her face. So we, we fitted her with a MyTap PAP mask with an automatic CPAP. That's Keith Thornton's design. That's the best CPAP mask in the world. And still, this got her through the pregnancy and she did just fine, but she still has a tethered tongue. And she's now on a pot appliance and tape at night and we're scheduling her for her tongue release and myofunctional therapy. <laughs> so early on, we tried managing her. Uh, we've managed her during her pregnancy so she could breathe better and have a healthier child. Now we want to move beyond management. So here are postnatal examples of incomplete gestational apoptosis. Got two toes joined together. You got five toes with web, lots more webs here, webs on their fingers. But there's one we see every day in our office and that's the restricted tongue. They're everywhere. And once you've seen it, you can't unsee it, right? These are adults we see every day in our practice. And you not only see the restrictions and the low tongue posture and the ability to, or inability to point their tongue, if you look at the top of the tongues, you can see scalloping on some of those tongues, which also tell us a lot about that tongue position and the inadequacy of their linguatoria. As I said, this is a cartoon in the New Yorker. I guess he made it for me. Unsee the giant tongue. And I'm telling you right now, once you learn to look at it, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. That's the message of all these things that we're doing and learning is once we have seen these things, we can't unsee them. And that's why we cannot possibly go back once we started down this road. So this is the magnificent tongue, the rudder of the brain with its face, body, and blade, and many muscles, all of which have genetically prescribed purposes and functions. And sometimes that tongue just needs to be set free and taught how to achieve its role in processing every substance the human body and brain must have to sustain life. So we were told, no, you can't release people's tongues. They'll choke to death on it, blah, 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 blah. We've got national pediatricians saying releasing tongues are just a fad hooked up by surgeons and dentists to make money. That's just bullshit. Those of us who know this know that that's bullshit. This is a very valuable thing. And if you listen to Dr. Zaghi and his disciples, you can see multiple cases where instant relief is almost achieved just by undoing one little pit, little bit of restricted tissue. So here's Andrew Banker. 
MDDDS, my favorite maxillofacial surgeon. If I could have had a son, I wish he could be just like Andrew. We had to talk him into doing his very first tongue release, and he said, well, I'll do a few, <clears throat> but if the patients don't like it or it isn't good, I'm not doing any more. So he did the first release and worked with Paula, our hygienist biofunctional therapist, as part of a, a program to help that first patient. And about the third patient he did was his father, and then he had Paula teach his father how to breathe. So he's now done hundreds of tongue releases in his in counting. And here we are. He's, I used to attend the first few to photograph him and see what how he was doing. He's getting ready to apply anesthesia to my good friend Bud Westmoreland, close friend and periodontal colleague, who's benefited greatly by a tongue release and homeoblock, followed by a pod and tape. And I looked at that picture and I thought. Good God, you know, we, I have turned into Mr. Burns. And Bud is going to have to do his myofunctional breathing therapy before and after release because, again, of structure, function, and behavior that we're altering, the behavior is the most important if we're going to have long term success. Breathing and swallowing behavior must change. So this ankylosis of the tongue happens to very young children and it affects the growth and development and health trajectory of their entire lifespans. That's a prenatal uh, image from Kevin Boyd. And you can see this retronathia on this kid. So you can pretty much bet they're gonna, that baby's gonna have a restricted tongue. So this is what they end up looking like. You get these this adenoidal face, long face syndrome, they're all mouth breathers. And again, they're my baby pictures. I was one of them. Now, I did not have a restricted tongue. We deal with two types of tongues. We got restricted tongues and stupid tongues. I did not have a restricted tongue. I just wasn't breastfed. I was fed formula from a bottle. Then I was fed pablum and baby food. So my tongue just never learned to work the way it should. So that's been a work in progress. And it happens in our family. I showed you Laney and that's Henry, our grandson. Both of these kids just worried me to death from the time they were young children because I was just starting to study this and I was looking at their behavioral problem with night terrors and other things like that, realizing they were having growth and development problems. You can see Laney's face, vertical maxillary excess. Wonderful, brilliant child, but issues because of this. And here you can see Henry uh, trying to swallow, and he's using all his facial muscles. And fortunately, we were able to find an orthodontist in Memphis who used a Herbst appliance. Uh, I was a little worried about the headgear effect, but it's really helped Henry a lot. He's pretty much outgrown this. And Laney's now had some great help uh, from uh, Dr. Joe Wasson, a wonderful orthodontist. But her treatment should have been started at age two, and we just waited too late. So you see this in your family, and it drives you crazy. And you want to do what you can to make sure that that wherever your children are, they have a team in their community who can do these things. Because here's what happens if you wait too late. These are dead infants. This is from uh, Gimeno's early article on pediatric death. These little kids uh, were all mouth breathers. Uh, there are pediatricians there from France. There are pediatricians were all told that these kids had trouble breathing and sleeping. They all died in their sleep. And if you look, you can see they all have these high vaulted palates and low tongue postures. And you can't see down their throats. And I guarantee you, if you were to lift up the tongue on those infants, you'd see that they were all restricted. 
Dr. Zimino, it was one of the great pleasures of my life was to actually get a chance to meet him after learning so much. We all stand on the shoulders of this recently deceased diminutive giant, uh, who, a Frenchman who did all his work at Stanford. And he, along with John Remmers, first identified obstructed sleep apnea. And he identified upper airway resistance syndrome, realized this was all a continuum and devoted the last part of his life to doing everything he could to promote airway health in very young children which of course is the thrust of everything we're trying to do today. So these kids all died in their sleep because nothing worked right, their tongues from the word go. Tragic. For us to succeed in helping patients transforming their breathing personalities, here's a lady who was a patient for 40 years I unfortunately persist, participated in having her head bicuspid retraction, extraction orthodontics because her teeth were crowded back in the 70s because I just didn't know any better. And she had breathing, sleeping problems, clenching her teeth, splitting teeth. And we finally, finally realized a few years ago, damn, you got breathing problems. And after releasing her tongue, putting her in a pot appliance with taping and doing myofunctional therapy, you can see a big difference. That's a transformation. That's why once you learn these things, you don't need a referral practice. The patients who've trusted you for years or are sitting in your chair every day need to be identified and helped. And you're gonna be able to help them in ways their physicians never did and never could and never would. But the patients have gotta do the work. It's their problem. And most of the solution they own by changing their behavior modification. We just do what we can in the most conservative fashion possible, at least that's our practice algorithm. Yeah, you can put them in double jaw surgery. Yeah, you can go in and do surgical robotic, cut out the whole back of their throat. You can try to fix it all at once with a big procedure, or maybe we can just try very conservatively to help walk them to wellness. That's our practice protocol that we developed and we'll talk about it. It's possible to reverse these disease processes through development of proper breathing, swallowing, and mastication. And we have to identify and work on all three. It's not just breathing. And we do this at any age. This is from Peter Litchfield and I tell it to every patient because the patient has got to be educated. The learning process is intrinsic if a patient is to identify what's wrong with what they're doing, what needs to be fixed, and what they have to do with our aid to fix it. So as Litchfield says, breathing's not just a physiologic process. It, for most of us, it's behavioral. <clears throat> we have all learned how to breathe based on how things developed. We may be compensating. We may all have we all have breathing personalities, which are habits. They're not hardwired. We're all hardwired to breathe from our nose to our diaphragm, but so many of us can't. And we have habits because we've tried to compensate for problems in structure and function. So we've got to be able to recognize how we breathe. The patient has to know that. Yeah, I'm breathing through my mouth. That, oh, yeah, my mouth isn't closed. My head is forward. I, that's not right. So they must be conscious of what they must do to correct their dysfunctional breathing through self-regulation. We're trying to make it possible so they can regulate their own breathing. And then their physiology will correct itself. And it's all based on the learning principles that govern habit development. This is all from Peter Litchfield. And I tell a version of this to every patient. I can't help you unless you're going to help yourself. In order to help yourself, you need to be thoroughly educated about what's going on. And you have to be totally committed to the program. And if you'll do it, I can't guarantee success, but I, we won't quit if you won't. So what changes do we desire for our patients to adopt in order for them to succeed on the walk to wellness by adopting Functional breathing, mastication, and swallowing. Well, here's a poster I gave 
seven or eight years ago at the Restorative Academy. Uh, some of that stuff on there you've seen before. And it's just trying to put in a nutshell what we see, what we think the problem is, uh, what our priorities are as dentists, and what we want to see our patients do. So our priorities are that we need to look, make sure a patient can breathe. That's the first thing we need to do. And then we need to do whatever we can to make sure they breathe correctly. And then we can take a look at their teeth. The teeth are only of secondary importance. Now, if they're hurting, they need an emergency first aid dentistry. Yeah, we do that. We don't do any comprehensive addressing of their problem until you've dealt with the breathing issue. So what are the goals for your patients? Close your lips, keep your tongue in your palate, breathe through your nose, swallow it out using your face, get your head and shoulders back over your shoulders, uh, head and back erect over your shoulders. Because we want you to achieve these automatic competencies. We want you breathing through your nose all the time. We want your lips closed unless you're eating or speaking. We want your tongue sitting against your palate until you swallow, and then we want the tongue to do the swallowing. We want your airway to be competent day and night. We want you breathing from your diaphragm. And we want you to have restorative sleep with balance in your autonomic nervous system. That's what we're trying to achieve. We're not just trying to throw a drug or a gadget or a surgical procedure at your problem, hoping that's going to right the ship. We want to help you walk to wellness. This may not be for everybody. I don't care. If we can help one patient at a time change their life, that's enough for me. And it could be possible if this type of thing becomes mainstream that people can actually make a living doing this and the insurance may end up paying for wellness. Miracles can happen. So this is a complex subject with a simple message and today's message, if you haven't guessed it, it's all about the tongue and the nose and the diaphragm, which is the pump for the lymphatic system. It's about how all of these structures develop and behave in harmony to promote proper function and behavior all the time. It's about this craniofacial respiratory system. It's about the face, and it's about what's behind the face with the airway, and what does it look like, and what can we maybe make it better, and does age, is that a problem? So today, how do we begin to help transform our patient's breathing behavior? Well, finally, finally, I think I hope I've talked enough about the how, why, when, and where, and why we're here, and what we're doing, and why it's so important. But we haven't talked about, okay, based on all the stuff we just talked about, what are we now doing in the most conservative fashion possible to take patients who are sick and tired of being sick and tired, identify their problems, work with a team to help them walk to wellness. What's that protocol? Let's talk about that. Okay, what do we do? Well, first we've obviously done an examination. And it's a pretty detailed examination, but I have it all in PowerPoint. And I don't have to remember a damn thing. And when you get old like me, you'll find that's it's a lot easier to look at a bunch of labeled pictures than it is to go try to either remember things or to go back and look at pages and pages of written word. Especially if you're recalling patients and you want to get yourself right back up to date. So first, we educate the patients to become aware of their problems and the changes we want to help them make so they can heal themselves. And we remember what Hippocrates said, do no harm. So we want to follow the least aggressive path to, to the development of silent nasodiaphragmatic breathing and a functional swallow. First, we were just thinking about breathing. Then we started thinking about breathing through their nose. Then we started thinking about chewing. Then we started thinking about swallowing. And it's all the same thing. And we've got to address all of it. Because if one of these is compromised, all of them are going to be. Now, if you've got a patient that's really sick, they may die in their sleep tonight. They may need to be put on a CPAP or a MAD intervention immediately. 
But our ultimate goal is to get them free from these mechanical airway management strategies, which are today really what dental sleep medicine is, management. And it definitely has a value. As I said, if Joe Sixpack is tired of sleeping on the couch and choking to death in his, in his sleep, and he can go into a CVS or a Walmart and buy a MyTap for $100 and go home and fit it and put a mouth shield on and make him breathe, self breathe through his nose and provide enough room for his tongue and begin getting a good night's sleep, that can have a profound effect demographically on the huge number of people who are sick today. So I don't want to denigrate the use of these appliances. I've just discovered that I am not willing to accept the changes to the bite that these problems can create, that, that these, these modes of treatment can create. And I just, I want to be able to treat a patient in a way where I think it's predictably low risk. So before we do any mechanical intervention, we want to create an obsessive awareness of the patient's tongue position. I want you to be thinking about where's your tongue? Close your mouth. Is your mouth open or closed? Where's your tongue? During the daytime, try to get it up in the roof of your mouth. Try to get it to just stay up there. Start working on that right now. Now you got your head and shoulder, you got your head forward. Your shoulders bent forward. During the daytime, when you're positioning that tongue, try to get your head and, head and shoulders straight and breathe through your nose and see if you can start using that nasal airway. And if you catch yourself breathing through your mouth, stop it. You'll really find if you've done some heavy exertion and you're panting through your mouth, that if you'll stand up straight and close your mouth and breathe through your nose, that that oxygen jet will go away in a hurry. This is a way you can, your body can show you the immediate benefit of proper breathing. Work on all this, become aware of it, because this is what we want you to become. And then give them some tape and see if they can breathe through their noses with their mouth taped. Let them be figuring all this out before you do anything. And then this is the appliance I like to use today. Dr. Scott Simonetti came up with it. It's called the Preventive Oral Device, or the POD. It's an inexpensive device, about $150 from the laboratory. All you need is a lower cast after you've figured out the design of the appliance. There it is, really simple appliance. It's got a bite block on one side, five millimeter bite block which simulates mechanotransduction. So what does this thing do? Well, immediately the patient will see when they put it in that their tongue gets lifted. Now they got a hell of a lot more room for their tongue. And if they've already been working on repositioning their tongue, now if they just have this appliance in, they got a lot more space to try to get that tongue start moving in, whether or not it ends up being needing release surgically or not. And if they use it with tape, then that will help bring that tongue up and forward because they're going to have to breathe through their nose if they can. Now, with this in place, the patient can push their jaw forward to open their airway without tooth contact. So they can, in essence, be doing that nocturnal bruxism, rhythmic activity to open the airway, but they can't wear their teeth. And it's a permissive device. It allows them to push their jaw forward but it lacks the forced protrusion of MADs, and so it limits possibilities of bite changes. And hundreds of these over about four years now, I haven't seen any bite change at all. So if we, if we walk the patient through by adding one thing at a time, this will help us. Many people, this is all they need. Bam, they're fixed. But Many of them may need their tongue released. So this helps us realize we already got them working on the things we want them to work at uh, consciously and unconsciously. Now we've provided room for things to happen. We've insisted on nasal breathing by taping their mouth. We may find out now they really need their tongue released. And if they do, then now they've got 
all this extra space when the tongue is released. So if they're wearing this thing at night, that tongue can come way up and forward more than if their mouth were closed. And for many patients, um, we can put a patient on a, uh, a pod and they can take their CPAP and reduce the, reduce the, the pressure on their CPAP until we move forward into more definitive treatment to get them off of that CPAP. And that bite block may help produce positive structural changes over time by mechanotransduction. If they repeatedly clench on that thing at night, it may stimulate stem cells and sutural growth. And I've got some patients where you can see the bridges of their noses and their cheekbones filling out just from wearing the pot appliance. So what else does it do? <clears throat> A bite block, when they bite on it, it stretches the ligaments controlling the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscles, and that opens the airway in an actual dimension. The brain may demand that the jaw clench to open the airway, and the pod allows the mandible to move down and forward away from centric relation when this clenching takes place. This protects the disc from impingement during clenching. It allows it to reperfuse at night. That whole capsule for relax any tension against the disc and re reduce any inflammation in those tissues. <clears throat> and at the same time, it reduces that hypotonic muscle activity and reduces the acid bite forces during clenching. In other words, if they're clenching on both sides, they're going to damage their TM joints. They're constantly putting pressure on them. <clears throat> and, they're, and they're clenching on both sides, which is bilateral compressive forces, and they're damaging. So with the bite block in there, they've got unilateral torsional intermittent forces. All of this really, I think, can help relieve temporomandibular inflammation. And it also helps quiet sympathetic activity. As they clench on that, it lowers their heart rate through the trigeminal cardiac reflex, all from a simple little piece of plastic. It also stabilizes activity of the vagus nerve, intrinsic in breathing and intimately related to the diaphragm. So there's Dr. Simonetti, smartest man I know. Here's his original description of why I created the pot appliance and what it does. And here he is talking about reduced heart rate variability. And he was giving a pitch to the uh, Department of Defense and using the pot appliances to help treat post-traumatic stress disorder. So before we make the pod, we take a photograph and we want to see which side of the patient's face is less developed. And so if you look at the left side, there she is. Look at the center, the middle picture and look at the right picture and you'll see, well, it looks like the right side of her face is the one that's underdeveloped. So let's stimulate bone growth on that side. Let's put the bite block on her right side. That's the only diagnostic determination we need to make about how we design that appliance. And then it's good to use a bunch of other things Good for them to read the Buteco breathing book by Patrick McEwen. They're going to tape their mouth shut at night. Um, they use some different types of tape. Uh, various, I use this uh, ocean nasal rinse. It's just saline. Uh, it's nice in the beginning, if, especially if we're going to develop an airway where a nasal airway is constricted. Crank it open at night with breathe right strips until they don't need it anymore. Uh, a lot of people have benefited from this nasal spray, and I really like cleaning out my sinuses with this Navage that runs a, a saline solution, pumps it in one side, pumps it out the other. All of these things can become very helpful. Also, we use uh, both over-the-counter commercial and cobbled-up devices that we've developed. Uh, they're breathing trainers. So we use them for developing proper nasodiaphragmatic breathing function and behavior and to strengthen the diaphragm and establish a toned airway musculature. Not a lot of people talk about airway tone, but I mean, what is sleep apnea? The airway collapses. What's our upper airway resistance syndrome? The airway partially collapses. 
muscles that are in, in good tone don't collapse. So if we can tone the airway along with any other volumetric improvements, we can really improve breathing functionality. And so these exercises are part of the patient, the work, part of the work the patient must do. This is one I haven't tried. It's called a relaxator. The idea is to create resistance so that you have to work harder and use your diaphragm, and it helps tone the muscles. We're getting ready to test these because they sure are portable. It could be convenient to have one at home, have one at work, have one in your car. You breathe into that thing, it may be the cure for road rage, who knows. Uh, my only problem with it is that how can you promote nasal inhalation with a device that uses your mouth? But that's contempt before investigation, that's my bad. We're gonna try these. And in the past, we use, this is the second version of the breather, which can create uh, resistance to help tone the airway but it's oral. So I ended up taking that, taking one of my tap map, one of these my tap pap masks, put a little scotch tape over those rebreathing holes to increase the resistance and encourage rebreathing of carbon dioxide. And so we stick them together. I stick a breather onto a uh, my tap pap mask and then heat up the mask, fit it to the patient's upper teeth. This particular patient has had her tongue released, uh, trying to get it up and forward. We've been trying to help her for almost 10 years now. Uh, she, a tap worked for a while. She's had her tongue released, but she still can't breathe through her nose because she's got nasal uh, restriction. So we're really trying to work on trying to develop nasal breathing. And so here she's got the device, it's held in place by her mouth. It's held firmly in her nose. And she's got her fist right there at the base of her ribs against her diagram, diaphragm. And we want her, the patients to do this before they go to bed because it will slow them down. It makes them concentrate on their breathing. It stimulates the right structure function and behavior. It also tends to shift them into parasympathetic activity, which is a really good way to get to sleep. So we want them to do it before they go to bed. Given my druthers, when they wake up in the morning, I just soon have them sit on the side of the bed before they get up. Their brain's already racing with, oh God, here's the stuff I got to do today. Calm down a minute before you start your day. Put this snuff device in. I will tell you why it's called that. Do it for five or 10 minutes before you get up to face your day. Once again, that creates homeostasis, puts you in uh, parasympathetic activity, and that might be a good way to start the day. So that's when I'd like for them to use it at least twice a day. Although the patient with whom we've had the most success used it all day long. So draw your own conclusions from that. People who have the device and don't use it don't get a lot better. It's just like having dental floss in your medicine cabinet. Doesn't do you any good unless it ends up between your teeth on a regular basis. So <clears throat> on the device itself, <clears throat> the inhalation resistance is set on zero. When she inhales, she's gonna provide resistance by pushing her fist against her diaphragm so that she can feel her diaphragm pressing and strengthening when she breathes in. That gives, us, gives her an awareness of her diaphragm and begins to strengthen it. The exhalation resistance on the device is set on six. So this way she's gonna have resistance breathing in and out. So put the fist against her diaphragm, provides a resistance on inhalation and her awareness, and it begins to tone that muscle of the diaphragm. So we're gonna have her inhale deeply and release her fist and count to five. Then with her, I want her to exhale using only the resistance of the device through her nose, slowly and fully. And then I don't want her to take the next breath until her oxygen hunger is sensed. This is some of the basis of buteco breathing. It's to not only have functional breathing, but to slow it down to the point where you're just doing what your body 
these. And I want them to repeat that for five to 10 minutes, do it at least twice a day. This is why we're using the other appliance and tape at night and all day long. We got them concentrating on, am I doing better? Am I breathing through my nose? Is my mouth closed? We're slowly repeating muscular behavior until the nervous system reprograms everything until it becomes default behavior. And we want them to breathe better and get better. So we call this device the Snuffleupagus, Snuffleupagus Airway Trainer, or the Snuff One, because it looks like that character on Sesame Street. And I, there's the, my good friend, the two-headed Keith Thornton, trying the first prototype that he cobbled together himself. And not only can it be used as a breathing trainer, you can pop it off and put it on one of these $6 uh, volumetric trainers that respiratory therapists use. And you can start developing your timing and your total tidal volume with that. So it can be a very useful device available for a couple of hundred dollars. So it's important along with all of this, especially if they're going to have their tongue released. They've already met Paula. Paula has shown them the exercises they're going to have to do before their tongues are released and that they're going to have to do them immediately after their tongues are released and may or may not have to do anywhere from five to 15 weeks after the surgery and that they may or may not in addition need buteco training. Everyone's individually different so these are all the different options available and we want to try to use as few of them as possible. Now, it's kind of hard to get anybody to do myofunctional therapy. It's hard to get men to do anything. So if we're trying to get them to work at night, I just, as a joke, came up with this. This is a take home bedtime passage for men using the men's toolkit of WD-40 super glue and duct tape. I mean, as Garrison Keeler said, why fix it right when you can fix it with duct tape? So you can see I put a little nose piece. I've got WD-40 saline spray. So every night before they go to bed, I want them to take a couple of snorts of WD-40 saline spray to get them breathing through their nose before they close their mouth. And so they can just use their duct tape to close their mouth. Uh, their wives would probably prefer if they use super glue because that'll keep them tape shut for a couple of days. Anyway, that's part of our real goal is what can we do in the real world to get people to do things they'll actually do. So this is the end of part two. In part three, we're going to put this all together. We're going to get to the fun part. We're going to show documented stories of patients from age four to age 84, all of whom are now healthier than when we met them. All right, give me a minute here. As the old man struggles with the machinery. Well, okay. Uh, if you have managed to suffer through all of part one and all of part two, I'm honored to have the chance to share this information with you. Uh, this is a real pleasure. We hope to see you in part three.